I'm thankful I uh, talked with Ray. Uh, he, he called me this week, and he told me, he said, man, he said, I tell you what, he said, whatever y'all did, he said, uh, it, it worked. Because he said, for the first time ever, he said, I didn't know I could do that. He said, I watched you on my big screen TV on YouTube Sunday. And he said, it never froze up, and nothing ever, it never hiccuped a time. And uh, Aub had texted me, he and, he, he and Lauren watched it down Baton Rouge, and he said it just ran uh, perfectly the whole time. So I'm thankful that uh, we got the cable back there, and maybe that's taking care of our problem. It'll probably poop out today just because I said that. <laughs> But it's good to be able to shut the doors to where they don't have to listen to me back in the back too as well. If you would take your Bibles and turn with me this morning back to Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11. And we're continuing to talk about this all-important subject of the just shall live by faith. This will be part five. The just shall live by faith. I think there's something to be said about it about that, that statement. You know, it's repeated multiple times in the New Testament. <clears throat> and each time when you think about ju the just, it means the righteous. That's, what, that's basically when you just substitute righteous, because it's the same word. The word righteous and just is interchangeable. And so what he's telling us here in this chapter is that you know, he's, he ended up chapter uh, uh, 10 this way. Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. But we are not of them that draw back to perdition, but them that believe to the saving of the soul. And then he began chapter 11. Now the, now the faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it, by faith, the elders obtained a good report. And as I told you last week, after, after he gives us a, uh, a, a detailed understanding of what the nature of true saving faith is, Paul is going to, or the writer of Hebrews, I, my Pam even asked me that, she said, who wrote it? Well, it's some people say Paul, some say we don't know. I, it, does it really matter who wrote it? It's the word of God. And we know all scriptures were given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. But here's the thing. Whoever wrote it, God the Holy Spirit moved the author of this wonderful book to bring forth multiple examples of true God-given faith as it is seen or revealed or evidenced in all these Old Testament saints. And he started back at the very beginning. In Hebrews chapter 11, look at verse 4 and 5. For by faith, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, by which he obtained witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and by it he being dead yet speaketh. When you think about it, faith throughout this whole chapter, and we need to understand this, faith throughout this whole chapter, you know what it is? It's belief, or it's an assurance, or it is a conviction of what God has said about himself. That's what faith is. Faith's believing God's promise. Abraham believed God. Didn't believe in God, he believed God. Whatever God said, that's the way it's going to be. And see, here's the thing. If we have True God-given faith. Because here's the thing. Faith is the gift of God. It's not something that's produced in the center. As we told you last week, the devils believe. Do they not? They tremble. How many devils are going to be in heaven? The answer is absolutely none. So whatever this faith is that he's describing, whatever this faith is that he's bringing forth all these evidences about... It is that which gives you and me something we don't have by nature. See, I, I, hold your place there. I, I can't help but think about this. Look over at Romans chapter 10. Look at verse 13. For whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord, be saved. And that word whosoever means 
every one of those, each. Those that believe, those that call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, notice what he says next, because you know, that, that's what our generation encourages men and women to do, and they have for many generations. Won't you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior? You know, I did that at 7, I did it at 20, one or we're about 18, I did it again at 21, and then finally the Lord revealed himself to me at about 26, 27 years of age. Big deal of difference. He found me. I didn't find him. Most of the times before, I found him. He was a God of my imagination. He was a God of my understanding. He was a God of convenience. He was a God that did what I wanted to do in able to, in, to enable me to be able to do what he wanted me to do. So he, he, here's the thing, and this, the, look, we can say this without apology. Whoever calls on the name of the Lord, whoever they are, no matter how moral they might be, no matter how immoral they might be, they might be a woman at the well out there that our Lord met in Samaria that had multiple husbands. It might be a gathering demoniac. It might be a Saul of Tarsus. No matter how moral they might be, no matter how immoral they might be. This verse tells me that if they call on the name of the Lord, and that's not just Jesus. <laughs> that, 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 I, to be honest with you, when people just use the name Jesus kind of like a, you know, a flip word, you know, like, like you know, I'm thinking about Jesus. Well, which ones? But the, the thing I always pops in my mind, which one are you thinking about? Because there's, there's more than one Jesus. We know that because down to our southern border, I bet if you went down there, there's multiple Jesuses down there, are there not? So the question is, when he says, whoever shall call on the name of the Lord, it's not just talking about that little five-letter word, J-E-S-U-S. It's something unique. It's something that identifies the true Christ of God. But he says this, if you call on him, you'll be saved. But then he asks this question. How then shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Paul said, I know whom I have believed. And am persuaded. Because I believed him. I persuaded what he's able. Right? How, how can you call on him in whom you have not believed? I mean, none of us have believed by nature. I know from Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, it says, Under you is given on behalf of Christ not only to believe on his name. What is that? It's given unto me, freely bestowed upon me to believe on his name, but also to suffer for his name's sake. You see that? How can you call on him in whom you have not believed? And he asks another question. How? Can they believe in him of whom they have not heard? And we know faith comes by hearing, and hearing comes by the word of God. The hearing ear, the seeing eye, the Lord hath made, yea, even to both of them. Uh -huh. how, can, how can you believe on him and whom you have not heard? And how shall they hear without a hearkener, a heralder? Somebody that de declares. And how shall they declare? How shall they herald? Except they be sent. I'm going to tell you what. There ain't nobody out there going out there to preach this message unless they're sent. Because <laughs> you know how it's going to be responded to. I mean, I, you think about it. To go out to, 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 it, to a group of people and tell them, there is absolutely nothing you can do that will save you. Not your faith, not your repentance, not your reform, not your love, not a change in your character and your conduct, not your going to church, or you're not going to church. That none of that has anything to do with your salvation. That salvation, full and free, is in a person who you cannot see, who you cannot hear with your physical ears, 
one who in his, as God man in our name and in our nature produced a righteousness that enables God to be just when he justifies us. Now who wants to go tell that message to somebody? Who wants to go over to the big Baptist church or the big Methodist church or the big Presbyterian church and walk inside where they're all there dressed today in their finery and singing their songs and reading the scriptures and they've tried real hard this week to love God with all their heart, mind, and soul and tried real hard to love their neighbors or self to go into there and tell them all of this that you've done does absolutely, positively nothing as far as your salvation is concerned. How do you think that's going to work out? Think they're going to throw a party for you? Huh? How are they going to respond? Same way they did to our Lord. Same way they did to the Apostle Paul. You think about that. Before Paul began to s preach this message that he was sent to preach, everybody loved him. He was the golden child of Gamaliel, wasn't he? And all them people that formerly loved him, when he goes forth with this message, what do they do? They take a vow that we're not going to eat and we're not going to drink until this man's dead. Why? It doomed everything that they thought valuable to them. I'm telling you, everything got to go. Everything. You can't hold on to anything and have Christ. Period. So he goes on. How beautiful are the feet of them that preach the gospel. Of what? Peace. What's the gospel of peace? That God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. And he's given unto us this ministry of reconciliation. And bring glad tidings of good things. Here's the best, the best glad tiding, tiding a sinner can receive. God justifies the ungodly. Are you ungodly this morning? Huh? I don't mean I don't mean that you're the most immoral pervert on the planet. That's not what I'm talking about. Do you, do you see yourself, that, do you recognize and understand this morning that even with what we're doing, now we're here this morning, I, I hope and I pray, and I, I think about this every time before I step up in this pulpit, every time before we come into these doors, we are gathered here this morning to worship God in spirit, to rejoice in Christ Jesus and put no confidence in human flesh. Nothing that we've done. But here's the thing. I recognize this morning that if this God of whom Abel obtained a good witness, a testimony from this God, that he was righteous, that if God were to enter into judgment with me for what I have just said and done over the last 15 minutes this morning, he entered into judgment with me over my performance, my duty. That, there's... I'd say there's something commendable in preaching the gospel as far as men are concerned. Uh, my stars, he says that, that you can't, sinners can't hear except somebody does what? Preach. But I thank my God through Christ Jesus, my Lord, Richard Wormack's preaching ain't coming up. My obedience, if there's been any of it this week, it ain't coming up, pardon the bad thing. I can't get that ain't, ain't, ain't thing up. <laughs> Maybe it's a southern deal or an uneducated deal, one or the other. But none of it's coming up. Huh? Ever. Is that good news? Well, preacher, you don't know what I did this week. Yeah, I know what you did this week because I know what I did this week. Think about yourself before the Lord revealed himself to you. Now, you just think honestly. Before the Lord revealed that there's only one righteousness, one you had no part producing or maintained, and one produced for you by a substitute, a surety, a redeemer, one who is himself both God and man. Before you heard that message, when you sat in that church, or you sat here even maybe before, you'd sit here with us. Before God revealed that to you, what did you think about your being in church? 
And if you weren't able to make it this morning, what would you feel about you not being here? Or if you prayed that week, what would you think about your prayers? Or if you studied the Word of God, what did you think about your study? Or if you were kind to your neighbor, how did you think about that? Listen, I have never, and it, this, this, this is going to sound awful, but this is the truth. I have never, ever, one time in my life loved God with all my heart, mind, soul, and strength. Oh, preacher, don't say that. I have not. I mean, think about what that means. See, we just think about the wake hours, don't we? We think about, the, you know, I get up at, well, this morning, Boomer got me up at 4.45. I, we think about from 4.45 to when I go to bed like the Beverly Hillbillies at 7.30 tonight, you know I mean? <laughs> but that's the time we think about. God doesn't say just love me during those 8, 10, 12 hours you got during the day, perfectly and completely, eternally. How long you got to do that? Every moment. You have troubling dreams at night? Evil dreams, vile thoughts, then you sleep? Huh? Love God. God with all your heart. All, all your heart. When, when, when I found out about Pam's eye Friday... Kenny, it was like my, my life ceased. It's, it's amazing what things of time and sense does to your life. And it, you know what it is? It's, and, and this is the thing God teaches me through these things. For me to be worried and anxious and troubled in heart, mind, and soul, you know what that is? That's unbelief. Because my God has told me, listen, he's told me and all God's redeemed in every generation what? All things work together for good to them. How many things? Even that I. Huh? See, cause we, 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 all we can do is look at it from our standpoint, by the, if we look at it naturally. When Joseph went into that pit, did you think, did you think he thought, <laughs> all things work together for good? What do you think? Why did he do this to me? What have I done? Uh huh. When Potiphar's wife pulled that on him, and Potiphar, whom he loved and was a devoted servant to, cast him into prison, do you think he thought, that's good? Or do you think, of all people to have their phone turned on, the pastor's got his, forgot to, I'm telling you, I forget everything, folks. My mind don't work good anymore. When those, he had interpreted those guys' dreams, and he said, when you go before the king, remember me, and they forgot him. Do you think he was in there just singing and praising and giving glory to God? No, he, he had lessons to learn, didn't he? Now, here's what time and lessons and patience and tribulation and trial did for him. Many years after that, when he's ascended to the throne right below, below the Pharaoh, right? And his daddy's died, and his brothers come to him. They're scared to death. Now he's going to get us because daddy's gone. Jacob's not here to protect us anymore. We're done. And he looked at him, and what did he tell him? You guys meant it for evil. But our God meant it for good. And he sent me before to preserve a people. Now, I guarantee you his mindset wasn't like that when he first went into that pit. And it took a lot of years of trial and tribulation. And that's why our Lord tells you and me, what are we going to have in this earth? A joy ride. Isn't that what he said? You're going to have a wonderful, it's like a roller coaster at Disney Park for your whole life. No, it's not. You shall, you shall through much tribulation enter the kingdom of heaven. In the world, our, this is our Lord. In the world, you'll have tribulation. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Who has? Not me. He has. And the fact that he's overcome it assures that even in spite of my sinful unbelief and doubt, what's he going to do? He's going to keep me. 
and he gonna present me to himself, holy, unblameable, and unreprovable in Christ Jesus, my Lord. So Abel here, you think about what it says, but by, by faith he offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain. We were talking about it this last Wednesday night on our Bible study. It might have been the time before, you know, that because uh, we, we were going through 1 John and we made it to 1 John chapter, uh, we, somehow we talked about it. We were in chapter 3, weren't we? 1 John 3. And we got over to that part where we're at today, these two boys, Cain and Abel. T hold your place there. Uh, turn, turn over to 1 first, first John because we're here. Might as well go ahead and deal with it. Now here's two boys. Same parents, right? Their mother and father had been taught in the, in the garden by the Lord that the only way sinners can be reconciled and brought into a right standing before God is how? An innocent has to die in your place. And this is to pa every parent everywhere. If you're, if you're not here this morning and you're watching us on this live stream, this is to every parent, myself included, every grandparent, every person that has a role in a child's life. Adam and Eve taught these two boys. They didn't trust it to the church to teach them. They didn't trust it to somebody else to teach them. As far as things spiritual, who taught them? Mom and Daddy did. What do you think they taught them? You say, well, we can't know that. Oh, yeah, we can. <laughs> you say, how do you know that, that they taught these boys, both of them? Now, they didn't get Abel aside and they say, look, we know you the elect of God and your brother over there is a reprobate. Huh? What did they do? They set both their boys down and they taught them. What did they teach them? Boys, we were in a garden in a perfect situation. And God gave us two commandments. He told us, he said, first of all, we could eat of every tree in the garden. Everything that's here is for our disposal. But he said, in the midst of the garden, there's a tree, a tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the day that you eat of that tree, what's going to happen to you? You're going to die. We violated God's revealed will by way of command. We ate. And I guarantee you they didn't spend a lot of time with Adam saying it was her fault. <laughs> Eve did it. No. They, it, Adam was our representative. Adam fell. And when he fell, what had happened to him? Exactly what God had promised. God's faithful to his promises. God's faithful to his threats. And so God opened their eyes. And they realized for the first time ever what were they? They were naked. Not just naked in the sense that they were without clothes on. What were they? they were naked before God. They had a, whatever they had before. And I, I, you know, I don't, God's word doesn't tell us. I know whatever they were before the fall, it enabled Adam to walk and talk with God. Because I know God will not allow anything. We know from the end of Revelation, ain't nothing unclean and unpure going into the presence of this God. My stars, Moses, was walking on the ground where the burning bush was at where he said, I got to go see this thing. A voice came. Our Lord Jesus Christ out of that bush spoke to him and said, what? Take your shoes off your feet because the, the bush is sitting on sand, burning. This, where your feet are at, it's holy. Why? This is where I dwell. And wherever I dwell, there's holiness. And so they could, they could walk and talk. Now, what are they doing? Before, he walked with God, talked with God, fellowship with God. God allowed him to name the animals. God gave him a helpmate and his wife. Now, what's he doing? He's hiding in the bushes. Sewing together fig leaves, trying to cover his nakedness. God speaks to him, Adam, where you at? God knew. God knew, and God called him out, and God dealt with him. He dealt with Eve, and he dealt with the, with the devil, that serpent. 
And he made the first promise in Genesis chapter 3, verse 15, that the seed of the woman would bruise the serpent's head. And he, the serpent would bruise his heel. That's speaking of our Lord Jesus Christ. We know that. And then God made unto them clothes of skin. So in other words, what happened? Same thing we say every time we take the Lord's table. Without the shedding of blood, no remission. So from that lesson, God drove them out of the garden. And then they have a son. And Eve, when she has the first son, Cain, what does she say? I've got the man. Was Cain the man? Certainly not. She thought, in her, in her infantile mind, she thought, this is, this is the seed of the woman. This is it. It's not it. Talking about another seed. The only seed. The eternal seed. From that point forward, they started teaching them boys that. They weren't five-point Calvinists, but I'll tell you what, they understood substitution, imputation, forgiveness of sin. They understood it because how does Abel come? He doesn't bring a live animal. What does he bring? He brings one that he himself has killed already. Who killed the Lord Jesus Christ? Well, we know it was God's purpose and plan, but who did it? We did. My sins cost Christ his life. So he killed it, and he comes before God. Because both these boys go to worship, right? You think about that. Two men, in the course of time, come before God to worship God. And it says that he brought a more excellent sacrifice. And I went all that way to get back to here. Bill said the other day that he's heard some people say that Cain was more, you know, Abel was more sincere than Cain was. It ain't got nothing to do with sincerity. We'll talk about that in just a minute. It ain't got nothing to do with sincerity. See, here's the, Abel believed what had been revealed to him through the declaration that his mother and father had intimately told him and his brother about. They told him, they, they, I guarantee it, they told him, boys, they, they understood, did they not? They had the best of times and the worst of times, didn't they? And they understood why God didn't kill them. Because he would have been just if he had But he spared them because what? It was all about that seed. It didn't have nothing to do with them. It got nothing to do with me and you. We are unwilling participants in the plan and purpose of God. It was all about him glorifying and honoring himself. That's why all this mess is down here. I don't, I don't care how many million, billion, trillion years I think it's been here. I don't care. It makes no difference to me. It's all about one thing only. God glorifying and honoring himself before us. Not glorifying and making himself more glorious. Glorifying himself to you and me. And we ain't, when we get there, all the glory that we've seen, and it's going to be glorious, is it not? We, we see it through a glass dimly. It's not going to change him. I know it's not going to change him because if he changes, he's not a God worthy of worship. He's going to be exactly the same. So these boys had been taught by their parents and being instructed by their parents and believing what his parents had taught him. And the only way he could believe it is what? God had to give him the faith to believe it. What did he do? He obeyed God's command. And he came the way God told him to come. How? You bring a lamb. Right? On the other hand, because I've heard some people make this argument. Well, Abel was a shepherd and Cain was a farmer. You wouldn't expect Cain to believe, bring a, 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 a lamb because he was a, he was a he tilled the earth. Well, if Cain had believed the same thing Abel believed, 
Because we know this. We know we've passed from death into life in that we love who? The brethren. He believed the same promise that Abel believed if he'd have went to his brother and said, Brother, I need a lamb. What do you think Abel would do to his brother? Not brother because they came from the same mother, but a brother in Christ. Oh, no. You've got to make do on your own. Huh? He'd have took his choice and said, here you go, bro. Let's go worship God together. But then instead, Cain didn't believe the instruction. He had been instructed. So listen, isn't it amazing? Two boys raised. You, you, you got two kids? You ever notice how different they are? Mine are different night and day. All right? Me and, me and their mother taught, taught both our boys the same thing as far as spiritual matters are concerned. And our prayer throughout their entire life was if the Lord was pleased and they were his elect, chosen in Christ before the foundation of the world, that he'd be pleased to reveal himself to them in his appointed time through the declaration of his gospel. But these two boys raised under that same message all their lives. I don't know how old they are. It doesn't tell us how old they are. Been raised under all their lives, and Cain didn't believe it. And so what does he do? He comes in a way that God says is excluded. You only approach me one way. How? Through a substitute. You know what, what by, him, by him coming with the fruit of the ground, you know what he basically acknowledged? He acknowledged God was the source and the cause of, of every temporal benefit he enjoyed in this life. That's all he acknowledged. That's it. God gave me the ability to go out here and till the soil and fertilize and weed and watch over and care for and produce all it. That lamb that Abel brought, could he give it life? He'd feed it, right? He'd groom it. He'd love it and care for it. He can't make it live. You don't offer a dead sacrifice. It's got to be one that's alive. You've got to kill it. So there's a distinction there. Abel's bloody sacrifice, folks, it revealed he acknowledged, he acknowledged it, the principles. He might not have understood them the way we do. We have more light, do we not? And understanding from what the apostles wrote in the New Testament, but he understood substitution. He was... <laughs> Old Testament saints said, folks, they weren't idiots. Matter of fact, really it'd make no difference if they were idiots. If they're taught of God, they're not idiots. I you, can be a, you, can, you can be dumb as a brick in a book. And if God reveals himself to you, you know all you need to know. It's not figuring, you don't figure God out. I think that's part of the problem with my generation. Somehow know they think that if we diagnose it enough and dig deep enough, that somehow we'll figure this out. You can't figure God out. We just take Him at His word. And see, He, he saw, this, this man Abel saw God in His redemptive character as a just God and as a Savior. I know that to be so. And Abel confessed that by coming with this, this lamb, this, this killed this lamb that he had slain, what did he confess? He confessed that he was a sinner. And he confessed also that the only ground and hope and cause of him being able to approach into a God that's so holy and so just and so strict that he will by no means clear the guilty was in what was represented and typified in that lamb. I, he had as clear a knowledge and understanding as what John the Baptist had when John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And another thing that we see in this, Abel's the first person whose God-given faith is expressly recorded and commended in the Scriptures. And he's a true believer. And what happened to the first true believer? <laughs> His brother murdered him. 
Isn't that amazing? Look here at 1 John chapter 3, verse 10. In this, the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. But this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. Not as Cain, who was of that wicked one, and slew his brother. Wherefore, why? Why did he slay him? Why did he kill Cain? Cain killed Abel. Why did he do it? Because his own works were... Well, what does it say? Folks, he came to worship God. Huh? You say, you don't know he came to offer... Go back over and read Genesis chapter 4. He came to offer... It says he came to offer a sacrifice. Folks, offering a sacrifice is worship. So he's come to worship this God that he's got in his mind. And God says that his act of worship, what was it? Oh, it's a good attempt. No. It's evil. It's evil. And I'm telling you, everywhere today, in all these churches gathered across this land, across this globe, if Christ is... As Jehovah sit canoe, the Lord, their righteousness is not believed in confidently by God-given faith and rested in as their only hope. Everything they're doing today is as damnable as the most vile sin you can ever possibly imagine. Let that one sit in your craw for a minute. You mean to tell me that singing and praying and preaching and sitting there with my brethren at a church all my life doesn't amount to anything? Nothing. Nothing. Matter of fact, if you think it amounts to something, you might as well be an idolater because that's what that is. If you think it makes a difference, you have, by you thinking it makes a difference, you have revealed yourself to be an active idolater. Because what is idolatry? Idolatry is attributing to God characters of con, qualities of character that he does not possess. Are not attributing to God qualities of character that he does to possess. What character of conduct is it that he does possess? He will by no means clear the guilty. He's just and justifier of who? The ungodly. What qualities of character does he not possess? Be it known unto you, therefore, men and brethren, that by this person is preached unto you what? The forgiveness of sins. And if you need sins forgiven, what are you? You're ungodly. By him, all the believing, all those that believe, are justified or declared righteous from all things from which you could not be justified by the law of Moses. Paul was very clear in the book of Galatians. If there was a righteousness that could have been produced by the law, how would righteousness have come? Can't get there from here. Not a good start point. You think about it, from the very beginning, God teaches us to not judge by outward appearance and circumstances. Because here's the thing, health and prosperity, they're not the standard of judgment. Remember David, I think it's Psalm 89, it might be 89, it's one of those songs, it's somewhere in them, one of them songs. He said he was standing there and he says, why do the ungodly prophet? Their lives are easy. And it, it enraged him, right? He got angry. You know, I'm, I'm in trouble. I've lost my kids. <laughs> you know, I've lost my kingdom. I've lost it all. Why? He said, but then you put me to where I saw. And then I saw that you, what have you done? You've put them, their feet in slippery places. And in a moment, what happens to them? They're gone. He said, then, when I saw that, well... It's changed my whole outlook on everything. Time and sense means nothing. You can have everything in the world. You don't have Christ. What do you got? 
I mean, I, I, I've said this before. I'll say it again, and I'll say it as long as I've got breath. I wanted my children to prosper more than me or their mother ever prospered in this life. But I didn't want prosperity, I didn't want fame, I didn't want accolades at the expense of them not knowing the true and living God. I would rather my, both my boys be riding on the rusting garbage truck, loading garbage. They don't do that anymore. They, they, they've got one of them machines. <laughs> I'd rather my sons be driving one of them garbage trucks or driving that street sweeper around rusting. If they know the Lord than to be the most famous athlete or musician or politician or anything in this world and not know God. Huh? Because it's not going to matter. I can't make my kids, I can't, my, I look at my little granddaughter and I love Zoe with all my heart. I want so much and I hope and I pray that she is one of God's elect. That's up to him. And I mean careful about the way I pray for my, my, my granddaughter now. Because, I mean, I, I'm, I don't want to be caught praying for a reprobate to go to heaven. Because that's not, we're not trying to get God to turn reprobates into elect. My prayer is, if good Lord, if she's one of yours, if she was chosen in Christ before the foundation were, if she is a vessel of mercy prepared for, before unto glory, I know in your time, according to your sovereign will, you'll reveal yourself to her. Just pray to give me the patience that if she's not, and trust that if she's not, let not my will, because what do we want? This my kids, I want them saved, right? If you loved your neighbor as yourself, instead of wanting your kids saved, who would you want saved? <laughs> you see how whacked up religion is? We out there beating, it, it, religion is like whack a mole on steroids. Just walk around bumping that thing down and missing every time. We got to love God. We got to love our neighbor perfectly, completely, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, 365 days a year for my entire lifetime, 64 plus years now. But somehow it's got to go all the way out yonder, all the way back yonder. Can you do that? Can the Holy Spirit enable you to do that? No. That's why this is an everlasting righteousness in which we have hope. It's in Christ Jesus our Lord. But think about this, and we'll quit with this this morning. Abel's bloody sacrifice, you know what it did? It evidenced that he had true God-given faith. Because it says, he by faith offered, Abel offered unto God a more excellent sacrifice and came by which he obtained witness. God testified that he was. Righteous. And you know what that teaches me? If you, if you go back, I encourage you to go back and read read 1 John 4, 3, verses 10 through 12, and then go back and read Genesis chapter 4, verse 1 through 8. This is what all this teaches me. Unless your person is accepted, and the only way, God is no respecter of persons. So how can my person be accept, accepted? In Christ. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Right? Blessed be the God and Father, our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him, right? Before the foundation of the world. Unless my person is accepted, my works are unacceptable. But if my person is accepted, if I'm declared righteous, everything I do by way of obedience, you know what it is to our God? It is a sweet-smelling sacrifice. All of it. You mean to tell me when we seek to worship God, our, 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 our Lord is pleased in Christ? When we pray, we pray in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We pray and we come approach Him through Christ Jesus, our Lord. Our prayers ascend to God through Christ and are acceptable through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Now, we'll stop right there and we'll come back next week. We'll talk about Enoch. You're dismissed the worshiper. I appreciate you.